Okay, so moving on from cover crop methods, just jumping right into kind of like intercropping your cash crops together. So a few years back, my coworker and friend John Henry Nelson sent out a, a, a video for us all to watch, and it was you, Lovell, um, who unfortunately recently passed. Um, but he is a, a brilliant biodynamic grower, and he was talking about the fact that turmeric and ginger are dynamic accumulators. He also tells us that they're nitrogen fixers. And when he said that, I thought about the fact that both turmeric and ginger are edge plants. They don't really like intense heat. And we have tomatoes which need to have space between each other. And I thought, what if we put tomatoes and ginger in between? We basically give two feet to every tomato we plant. And that's about the only way we can be assured of not getting various tomato diseases. I thought, what if we put turmeric and ginger in between them. I ran it by you lovely. He said, great idea. We've been doing it for a few years. And we haven't done a test to see if we're losing yield on the tomatoes. I suspect we're losing somewhat. Ironically, that tape you see in this picture is for another trial that was being done on, being done on those tomatoes. And I just didn't think to say, while you're at it, notice, please, if the last 10 or 15 feet of that row, which we didn't have enough turmeric plants for, is giving a better yield. I don't think it's giving much of a better yield. The plants are all about the same size and we're getting you know, excellent yield of a great variety, Czech bush tomato, um, which is a bush that is the, produces all year long. So it's kind of like an indeterminate bush. And we're getting huge turmeric. They're benefiting from it incredibly. And we've seen that the turmeric and ginger actually seems to do better interplanted with the, and the um, nightshades. And something that we just figured out is this is in greenhouses in greenhouses with a little bit of mulch, the turmeric and ginger will not die and freeze out. It'll come back the next year. And so we actually have right now a greenhouse planted to loads of turmeric plants that we just never got in the ground. And they are gonna be growing next year and we're gonna plant tomatoes in between them. And that's where some management might come in actually because if the turmeric gets anything like the turmeric in here, we're gonna be actually making that turmeric work harder and taking some leaves off it. And that's real important. It's a point that we want to make over and over again. We're in charge. The main crop that we're going to be aiming for next year is going to be the tomatoes. So the turmeric is going to have to wait, but you know what? It will. And it'll come on strong when the tomatoes are done. The turmeric is not going to really die back until sometime in late November, early December, since it's in a greenhouse. And we will, by next November or December, get, get an incredible crop of turmeric where actually what we were mainly were growing were tomatoes. And right now, the turmeric is slowing down in a nice crop of kale. So we're getting lots of use from that greenhouse. Yeah, and maybe it's worth noting, I think we talked about this earlier, that ginger might be a, a preferable over turmeric because of the- It uh, actually is, the, yeah. The leaves yeah. are a little bit smaller. So well, maybe, maybe they let light through a little bit better. What I'd say is it's preferable for the tomato, but we actually think we see more response as far as the crop benefiting with the turmeric, you know? Gotcha. The ginger, the ginger may, maybe it's not as robust and it doesn't get, you know, it doesn't get taken much, as much advantage of the situation. But it works for both, you know. But yeah, if you want to try this first and you're a little nervous, start with ginger. It's got more air, more airflow and it works, it probably will be easier on your tomatoes. But I can tell you those tomatoes aren't hurting at all. They're producing really well. For some other examples, before kind of launching into some examples, I, I think it's worth putting a little bit of a, a framework on this. And I think that this could work well if you can just do a good job of pairing overstory and understory plants. And overstory being something like corn or okra grows tall, might have spaced out leaves, thinner leaves to allow enough light through to get to the understory. Or maybe there's just a good cool season, warm season thing going on to where the, the cool season stuff is okay to hang out as an understory plant until the corn or okra or whatever your overstory plant is kind of starts to die back. Well, I personally haven't done this with okra, at least not on purpose. I've had some volunteer cowpeas that um, worked okay in okra. I think okra could work if paired with something like a cowpea, something that's like a pretty vigorous understory plant, vining one. Um, and granted, that's like, those share the same season. Um, it's possible that you'd need to be pretty particular about your varieties. I was growing that in Puerto Rican evergreen, which is one of the um, ones that's been recommended. Um, and you know, while you're going through and picking okra, it might be necessary to thin out the leaves, thin out that overstory a little bit, which are food, by the way, you can eat uh, okra leaves for sure. 
along with the pods as you're harvesting them as you go along, freeing up a little bit of space and sunlight for everything that's under, underneath. Now, in the understory, it could be a lot of different things. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the three sisters where you've, you're pairing squash uh, with corn and with beans, but it can be way more than just uh, squash and beans. For example, sweet potato, also sharing that same warm season, but it could totally be cooler season crops like onion, pea, beets, etc. And so the, the picture in the top right is onions and oddly gladiolus. And in this study, they were also testing out peas and beets uh, paired with corn. So taking advantage of the different seasons there, cool season crop hangs out in the understory until it's sort of released once the corn starts to thin out or is harvested. And a couple of points um, to elaborate on what Mark is saying. Um, one is that you might have cow peas on the, um, the south facing side of your okra if you're growing it east west, um, and you might have lettuce on the north facing side. And that might get, allow you to have lettuce get enough cool, um, cool conditions where it does well in the heat of the summer. Another is that you actually not only can eat the okra leaves, but cow pea leaves are actually very good eating too. So you will be eating you know, greens while you're doing this. And then finally, I just like to reflect on the fact that we always talk about the three sisters, but I guarantee you, I'm certain that the indigenous peoples that employed this were doing the three sisters, the nuclear family, and the extended family, epizote, cilantro, you know, a whole array of edible greens, things like gallon soga. All of those things were being harvested from that same patch. That is the way indigenous farmers farm. There's not, there's not an opportunity that's missed. There's way more nutrition on the average square cornfield than we even consider. It's all capturing solar energy and it all can nourish us or nourish the soil. Mm -hmm. And um, as maybe a final note on the kind of like framework for all this, I, I think it's fair to expect a lower crop yield per crop so that like your corn might not do as well as if it were like all on its own. Um, but, and, or your squash or your sweet potatoes or whatever is sharing the space. But it's, um, I, I would expect, however, that instead of a, a lower per crop yield, you would at the same time see a higher per area yield so that like your combined corn and sweet potato harvest is more than if you had grown those things in separate spaces, which is fun and fascinating in my opinion. Um, and not only from a yield perspective, but probably also greater biological activity, like we've been talking about this whole time, and um, potential future fertility, all that kind of good stuff plugged in from just having those things share the same space. And I would say to that that you should probably count on a reduced yield, but you may be pleasantly surprised. Um, one example I just gave was that purslane in that year of drought, you know, but also we did this, and we're gonna have a slide showing it shortly, um, we planted multi-species cover crops into our brassicas right into the mulch bed, and they did really well. They were like really lush. If the kale and the collards weren't good and tall, they would have been competed with by the cover crop. And literally, in early May, when normally we would have taken our kale out because of how bad it would have looked, my coworker Jeremy Greist walked out with a huge armful of kale he just harvested. Said, Pat, I swear, that kale's doing better. And I would attribute that to the fact that that cover crop was keeping the soil cool. And it was respiring, and that's cooling the air, and so actually the crops did better. And another thought that I just realized while we're giving this presentation, because the possibilities are endless, is there are times the crops we have actually benefit from the protection that a cover crop provides. You know, benefit less frost damage. You know, you can have fava beans do better in a, in a mixed um, planting than you'll have them do on their own. And so, because we have to budget and make sure that we're gonna do well as farmers, we should always count on a somewhat reduced yield, but we may be very pleasantly surprised. It may actually be a maximized yield. Absolutely. Okay, final example. Okay, this is the same time that I talked about where I just went kind of wild with interplantings at the Highland Lake Inn. And indeed, there's one I don't have a slide of where my, my ultimate um, boss, the matriarch of, of the Lindsay family that owned the, the Highland Lake Inn, walked out and looked at it. She said, that's almost too much for me. I almost can't stand to look at how much you have planted in there. I had so many different varieties of things that were gonna come out. I had cilantro, I had um, green onions, I had lettuce, I had all these different things mixed in to a main crop of, um, 
I'm not even, I don't even remember what the main crop was now. I think it was probably broccoli or something, right? But the broccoli were young seedlings. But this was another example. This was, you know, essentially we planted small seedlings of fennel. And as they were established enough where they wouldn't be too encroached on by lettuce, we came back and seeded lettuce. And you can see that they're both thriving here. The lettuce is gorgeous and it's due to be harvested. And that's probably good because it's going to start to impact the, the fennel a little bit. But maybe not even all that much because most of the leaves of the fennel are up above. And the old, the old way we looked at it is, but they're competing below. They're, that lettuce is taking nitrogen and taking um, nutrients and water from the fennel. Well, the fennel sure doesn't look like it. And from what we know now, probably not. They're both pumping exudates into the soil and maximizing the life of the soil food web. So that's, that's basically the story there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think if we put in, that's kind of the end of the kind of intercropping idea um, before we move on to weeds. But of course, there are going to be many, many other combinations and sequences of crops that you can do. And we can't go over them all, of course. Um, and maybe the, the best guiding principle here is that idea of complementarity, just things that have complementary growth habits, architecture, timing, etc. Find ways to combine those so that you've got just a, a um, multitude of species in a relay or in the same place at the same time. Two other easy ones that I can think of that could have gone in there would be pea shoots or um, radishes. You know, both of those would have easily worked in the same situation. <laughs>